Good evening. Uh, we're not starting the business part of the agenda yet because some of the board members who are coming from work are still on their way. But we will start with our uh, student presentation. So, uh, Madam Superintendent. Uh, thank you. Good evening. So, uh, in this evening's uh, achievement and highlights, I'm excited to share the work of two terrific seniors who are leading projects to elevate the experience and the voices of historically marginalized communities through our curriculum and our instruction. We aspire to graduate students who are ready to transform their world. And the students um, that we are celebrating tonight are doing just that. The first presentation will be led by uh, Ms. Amy Boudelier, the capstone teacher here at Sports Medical Sciences Academy, and Ali Atif, a senior here at SMSA whose efforts to uh, bring together wheelchair athletes was recently spot, uh, spotlighted uh, on the local news. So I'm going to ask for them to join us and share their highlight. Good evening, Board of Education members. Thank you so much for having us. We are super excited to be here. Um, anytime you want to hear amazing news about what your Hartford students are doing, please, anytime, give us a call. We'd love to share. Today we're going to talk, um, Ali is going to tell you what he did for a senior capstone project. Take it over, Ali. Hi. Uh, so, the button. The button. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my capstone project for this year was the wheelchair rugby tournament hosted by me in the Gaylord Hospital. And basically what it was was the gathering of wheelchair rugby uh, teams from Connecticut, uh, New York, and New Hampshire for a basically an invitational. And what it was is that uh, <laughs> it was basically just a gathering of all the teams and getting together and basically having fun. Uh, I took, took upon like the responsibility of this, uh, partnership, this uh, project because uh, due to my personal life, my father uh, had gone into an accident when we were in fourth grade. We were driving up to uh, Canada and off of Syracuse. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we were driving up to Canada and we were next to the Syracuse hospital where a uh, double tractor trailer, drunk one, we presume, uh, whiplashed us into a tree at around 80, 85 miles an hour. And we hit the tree that was in the median of the highway head on completely total the car. My dad's uh, entire right leg was stuck under the car and the tree while the car was smoking. Uh, uh, so basically when that happened, after a few months, he was basically in a wheelchair for around three to four years. And now he's walking, walking with a uh, cane and uh, walking with a cane and he has a wheelchair, but we rarely use it anymore just due to the fact that he's getting better through medicine and uh, exercise and whatnot. So, yeah. So uh, one of the big focuses for SMSA students is that the project has a personal connection. And Ali saw this project as a junior when another student took it on. And so he decided then that that's what he wanted to do for his uh, capstone project. And the Gaylord Hospital every year is looking for a place. And for the past four years, between um, the commitment of Hartford Public Schools and SMSA, we've been extremely, you've been so supportive that we were able to host the rugby tournament for the fourth year. And they, they were on Channel 3 News. <laughs> Teams from across New England competed in the Gaylord Wheelchair Rugby Invitational Tournament today. It took place at the Sports and Medical Sciences Academy in Hartford. Event organizers, Ali M. Tiff says he did it as his capstone project to answer the question, how can you help your community? Inspired by his personal experience, he looked at the benefits of communication and physical activity for paraplegics. Well, my father, uh, we got into a car crash a couple years ago, and since then I've always wanted to help people who uh, who have struggled just like he did back in back a couple years ago. So it just makes me happy to see everyone, you know, having fun. And congratulations to everyone who participated in today's event in the capital city. Thank you. Thank you both for your leadership, and good luck to you. Thank you. 
I am now honored to introduce uh, Mr. Bobby Abate, a social studies teacher at Hartford Public High School. My name is <laughs> And um, senior Darren Mack, who's actually gonna join us via uh, video because due to the change uh, in board meeting date due to the snow day, um, Darren has to watch for his little brother, so he can't be here today. But uh, Mr. Abate is here, and um, just to give you some context, over the past two years, Darren has led efforts to commemorate the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which, as we know, abolished slavery. And recently, his uh, December 6th project gained attention not only of local, state, but also national uh, political leaders, including Congressman John Larson and Senator Christopher Murphy. I am excited to present um, Mr. Abate and uh, Darren um, this evening. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to share with you some exciting work. Uh, it has been my, my name is Bobby Abate, and it's been my honor and privilege to teach at Hartford Public High School for the last 35 years. I love that school, and I love the kids. Uh, just to give you a quick background, because I want you to listen to Darren. I wish he was here, and he wanted to be here. But you'll hear from him, because you're all going to be invited to a celebration we're having in May in our courtyard. So you'll, you'll be getting that invitation. Uh, the December 6th project has been a two-year journey for us. On December 6th, 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed. It was ratified. Slavery was legally ended on that day in America, legally, OK? Year after year, I would ask my students, do you guys want to celebrate this? Is there something we should do? And silence, no response, no interest. Uh, as a matter of fact, December 6th has <coughs> quietly passed by all of us for the last 154 years. Why we don't celebrate that day is beyond me. But it's changing. Uh, it was unnoticed by all until last year. My US history students, led by Darren Mack, decided that they wanted a small celebration. So in our courtyard, under a dead tree, freezing cold, with balloons and speeches, we celebrated. OK? You know, to have students buy in and identify a problem, an obvious and glaring omission in our nation's history, and to then follow up and do something about it, take ownership of it, is everything a teacher wants. I thought I died and went to heaven. Uh, we then brainstormed, what are we going to do next? And we went to Will Delise Bermudez, a Hartford Public graduate, student of mine, uh, and she passed a resolution on the city level. And every December 6th in the city of Hartford, they will celebrate and acknowledge December 6th as the day this ugliness called slavery ended in America. On July 9th of this year, Governor Ned Lamont signed our bill into law. State Representative Joshua Hall in the audience here, another Hartford Public graduate, took our proposal and sponsored it. We went and talked at the Black and Latino uh, Caucus at, at uh, the Legislative Office Building, and we won support. And again, this summer, our bill from Hartford Public High School is now state law. And next year, every school system will incorporate that into their curriculums. I am so proud of my kids, and I am so proud of my school. You know, Hartford Public has been up and down, but there are pockets of learning there that have gone on since 1638. Uh, we are planning a celebration in May, and let me just say, you are all invited. We are planting a new tree. We are ordering and designing now, my students, a plaque commemorating the day. And, uh, and we are now working with Senator Chris Murphy and Congressman John Larson. 
We don't want this to just be a state celebration as it is. We're probably the only school system celebrating it. Uh, we, we're having an uh, essay contest for grades for all through the city, grades 8 through 12. And with the help of Karee Fletcher, uh, this is taking off. And with the help of John Gale, who was at our celebration uh, last week, our second celebration, John Gale and Hartford Public High School Alumni Association has just donated $500 for the winning essay. So we want this to be a statewide essay next year. You know, in closing, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, we celebrate July 4th as our Independence Day. Yeah, that's nice. I think, however, we should re-examine that. On December 6th, 154 years ago, we started a journey to become a free country, a true nation with equality, truly free, a real Independence Day. And I ask you, all we want is for you to spread this awareness. We want this December 6th to be out there. I'm not sure anyone in this room has celebrated December 6th. I know I didn't, but we're going to. And I want you to get your contacts in the media and spread the word because our students deserve recognition. Our school system deserves recognition. These are uh, this is Public Act number 19-152, signed by uh, Ned Lamont, and this is the ordinance for the city of Hartford. We're not going to stop. This is going to be a national celebration. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bate, um, for your commitment, the energy that you bring and the passion, which is still the same as when I was in your classroom in, <laughs> in the late 80s and early 90s. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. I'm Mac, and I'm a senior at Harford Public High School. I um, created the um, December 6th project in um, conjunction with Mr. Bate over two years ago when he um, asked a collective um, class whether or not they'd like to participate. Knowing the weight of the 13th Amendment and what it means for a lot of the minorities within not only our city, but the United States of America, I had to take that opportunity. I feel as if the 13th Amendment is not only a stark reminder of um, the brutality of slavery and the viciousness that was brought upon it a good 200 years after it, but I feel like it also is a reminder of reconciliation, hope, and peace that could be achieved within our nation today when race relations are at a stark low. In my own opinion, I feel as if this 13th Amendment is something that needs to be known by everyone. It's a shame that a lot of our students here in this uh, school and within the district don't know what the 13th Amendment is, considering that it guaranteed our freedom and it guaranteed that we could have an equal chance within a country that was based upon equality, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I um, will keep working with the December 6th project until the rest of my life, I hope, because I feel as if this not only should be recognized uh, locally, but as a national holiday. It's always been my ultimate goal to be able to enlighten the masses about our uh, history. I feel as if people often um, take our history for granted and they're not often interested in it, but I feel like such a you know, great um, bill such as this, I feel as if it needed to be told, the story needed to be told, and the story will continue being told as long as I can and as long as others can. Thank you. My name is Darren Mack again, a senior in Hartford Public High School. This has been a great opportunity. Thank you. And now we'll move on to public comment. Uh, Ms. Oliver, Ms. Brody. I apologize. Mr. 
We as a board in collaboration with the superintendent and district leadership are committed to cultivating a culture of excellence at all levels of HPS. We thank you for taking the time to attend tonight's board meeting. We appreciate you coming out to learn more about Hartford Public Schools and for sharing your thoughts and concerns. We have established a protocol to track and respond to concerns raised. We want you to know that we take your concerns seriously and to that end, we will have staff available for immediate follow-up if follow-up is required. After you have finished speaking, a staff member will come up to you ready to take your information down. They will follow up with an update within, 20, within 48 hours. As a reminder, you have three minutes to speak. At the two minute mark, Ms. Santiago will ring the bell letting you know that you have one minute left. At the second bell, please wrap up your comments. Now Mr. Julio Flores will read this in Spanish. Thank you. Nosotros, la Junta de Educación, en colaboración con la Superintendente y personal del Distrito, estamos comprometidos a cultivar una cultura de excelencia en todos los niveles de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Les agradecemos que haya tomado el tiempo para asistir a la reunión de la Junta esta noche. Les agradecemos su participación y su deseo de aprender más sobre las escuelas públicas de Hartford y también por compartir sus pensamientos y preocupaciones. Nosotros tomamos sus preocupaciones muy seriamente y hemos establecido un protocolo para el seguimiento y respuesta a inquietudes planteadas. Tenemos personal disponible para seguimiento inmediato para los casos que lo requieren. Una vez que usted haya terminado de hablar, un miembro del personal estará disponible para tomar su información. Esa persona investigará su caso y se comunicará con usted dentro de 48 horas. Le recordamos que tienen tres minutos para hablar. Cuando hayan pasado dos minutos, la señorita Santiago sonará el timbre, dejándole saber que le queda un minuto. Al segundo sonido, por favor, termine sus comentarios. Salve. Joshua Hall. Good evening, uh, Chairman Flores, Superintendent. Uh, I'm here um, instead of, of Andrea Johnson as a result of the change in date. She wasn't able to be here, so but she wanted me to make sure or ensure that uh, her statement was read uh, publicly. Good, e good evening, uh, Board of Education members uh, and Superintendent Torres Rodriguez. Uh, recently, uh, NBC News reported that there are several Hartford school buildings that have not been tested for the possibility of PCBs. Hearing this news is jolting, to say the least. Uh, it brings back uh, the memory of Clark School closing. Many, many fears were held by the many people that attended or worked in that school. It was a difficult time for the Hartford School District. <coughs> when I learned, and this of course is Andrew Johnson, uh, this news, I spoke to Superintendent Torres Rodriguez as to what was going to be done to learn the status of the named schools that had never uh, had testing of their environment. The superintendent told me at that time that there was no requirement to test these schools. I again asked uh, what was her plan to have these schools tested and told that there was not a plan due to the fact that had not been a mandate to test the schools. My reaction was, but there are children and adults in those buildings that could have a toxic environment. Why would the BOE not test these schools that have never been tested? I received no more information. As a result, uh, the HFT filed a complaint with Connecticut OSHA, and we're still waiting for that complaint to be addressed. Now, I've learned from a letter that went home to Parents of Achievement First that the administration has assured staff and families at the Achievement First building that it will be tested for PCBs during the winter break that begins Friday, December 20th. As the Administrative Achievement First has made the commitment to the school building tested is commendable. The question for this BOE and superintendent, where is the equality? 
why are, why are not Harford, Harford Public Schools being treated equally? How does the administration ignore testing the remaining schools that have not been tested for PCBs? This screams of an unfair practice to those children and adults that must be present in the building that have not been tested for the possibility of the toxic environment. Additionally, and I think this is very important for everyone to understand, Achievement First does not own the building they currently occupy. That is a Hartford Public Schools uh, building that Achievement First, is a, Achievement First is being allowed to use. Doesn't Achievement First need permission to perform any test of this nature from Hartford Public Schools? The number one responsibility of Harvard Public Schools is to keep its students and employees safe. Not testing the schools is a most shameful and unacceptable for our students, teachers, and support staff. Please do the right thing for all of Harvard children and staff. Thank you. Robert Camacho. My name is Robert Camacho. Uh, I'm a parent of, a student, of two students at the Montessori Magnet School uh, in Hartford. Um, I also am here to address the PCB issue. Uh, and I, uh, when I told my wife I was coming here to talk to you folks, um, I told her I was here to shame you. And she told me that that wasn't the right way to address this, uh, this board. But in looking over your credentials, you're all highly credentialed individuals. I believe that you should feel ashamed. It should, you should all feel ashamed at the lack of response to this very serious issue that all of our children face every day. And I had, have read the superintendent's argument that this issue is not mandated and therefore there hasn't been testing so far. And that is, in my opinion, a uh, very poor argument. I'm sorry, just I wrote some things down. I'm not very good at public speaking, so you'll have to um, bear with me. Um, there's just no justification for any delay when our children are potentially exposed. My children, specifically, um, who are my life, uh, are potentially exposed every day that they go to school. Uh, there's no excuse for not testing. If this was asbestos, and it was a potential hazard, asbestos hazard, and it got out, and it was over the news, I guarantee you that this school board would have already tested that, that building, any building that would have a potential asbestos hazard. PCBs are as insidious as asbestos and should be treated with the same respect. The children should be treated with the same respect. I just recently heard on the radio yesterday, and it, I couldn't even believe my ears, I heard uh, a commercial for the Hartford Public School System uh, exclaiming how we hold our students to a higher standard. Well, what about the board? What about the members of the administration that, look, that govern that school system? What standards are you holding yourselves to? Because inaction is as much an action as, and, as participating in something, uh, participating in an evil let's say. And the evil in this case would be to allow students to be in an environment that is degrading their health and will have serious health effects for the rest of their life, irreversible health effects. So I would really appreciate if this board would, especially at this time of the year where we all take stock of our lives and look over the things that we've done this year and think to yourselves, what is your moral responsibility? What do you, as board members, overseeing the, what, the welfare of these students, what do you owe these students? What should you do, and how does the inaction of this board speak to your moral character? Each of you should think about this. Um, all I can say is, if I were you, and I didn't do anything, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. And I really hope that you take my words to heart because it's, I, it's inexcusable. That's all I can say. These students, I shouldn't have to be here. It's a failure that I'm, of the Harvard Public School System that I'm even here having to advocate for my children and all of the children and the teachers 
that are in these buildings. We should know when we drop off our children that they're going to a safe environment. They trust us to do that. And I am failing them every time I bring them to that school. And I bring them to that school voluntarily because I live in Newington and my children go to Hartford Public Schools because I, my parents were both lifetime teachers of the Hartford Public School System. And Mrs. Uh, Torres Rodriguez, you were a, a student, of, I understand, of this Hartford Public School System. It, there's, it's inexcusable that you would delay testing of any of these schools. It's very disappointing to me to hear that you were also a student and have delayed in this. Thank you very much. Carol Gell. Good evening. Carol Gale is my name, Hartford resident, as well as a teacher in the school system. And I'm also here to speak on the PCB issue. When it hit the news and went viral, I came into school the day after everybody was on social media talking about the NBC report, and quite frankly, the amount of fear that I was hearing from my colleagues I had never witnessed before. Everyone was concerned, everybody was scared, and everybody was saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So being somebody who likes action over inaction, I decided that we needed to petition at least to put our thoughts down on paper. So I am here to tell you that I am representing at the minimum 201 teachers who have signed this petition who have concerns over the level of PCBs. The main thing that we are asking for is simply transparency and communication. If there has been testing, why don't we know the results of those as your employees? Um, I agree with Mr. Camacho that it is a moral obligation. It may not be your legal responsibility, but there is a moral obligation to all of us who work in these buildings. Um, and these petitions extend beyond the 10 buildings that were cited in the news because we do transfer from one building to another. So we, the undersigned, being employees of the Hartford Board of Education, hereby request that the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools provide clear information about the status of each Hartford Public School building regarding its testing for PCBs. Reports of such testing and the response by the Board of Education to provide remedy where appropriate. The only information we have regarding this situation is from the media, specifically the NBC Investigates report that aired on November 18th, 2019. Um, I'm aware that since then the superintendent did send us a letter, but I must say that as an employee, it was disheartening to hear this information from the news instead of from the board itself. Um, this report named 15 schools that were built or remodeled during the years when dangerous PCBs were used in building materials. Of those schools, 11 were never tested. We request the results of testing performed at Belize, Buckley, Global, and Weaver. And we request that testing be performed at Bachelder, Breakthrough 2, Classical, HPHS, Hooker, Kinsella, Fisher, Parkville, Pre-K Magnet, and Wish schools. Additionally, we request to know if the Police Academy building, also used by global students and staff, was tested, and if so, what those results were. As employees, we believe this information should come from the Board of Education directly to all staff and parents. We all have a vested interest in the environment in which we work and in which our students learn. The above mentioned news report caused alarm among those who utilize the aforementioned buildings, knowing that PCBs cause health problems, including cancer, and could be affecting the health of all adults and children who spend time in these buildings. Thank you. Michael Downs. Good evening, board members. Uh, Michael Downs, 74 Rosemont Street in Hartford. PCBs. I brought this issue up four years ago. I stated that all buildings, this is just after the report of the John C. Clark School uh, PCB problem, and uh, they said that all schools built or renovated between 1950 and 1980 when the PCB problem was, a, was an issue um, be checked thoroughly. And they should be tested as thoroughly as the John C. Clark School was tested. 
This is a state and federal problem as well as a local problem, and that's where the money should come from. Um, I just, uh, uh, it should have been done then, and uh, now we're faced with this. This board and this superintendent is, uh, now has to face it now, and we've got to do it as soon as possible. Again, I want to mention the, the, um, the fact that we also need to get state and federal money to uh, help us uh, recruit uh, minority teachers, especially African-American, Caribbean-American, and Puerto Rican male teachers, uh, also female teachers, but uh, there is a dearth of uh, male teachers in the system. And the behavior problem, uh, they're, they're, that, that last issue, and the fact that there's no vocational technical education in the school system goes a long way toward um, uh, uh, toward the uh, behavior problem in the school system. If kids had uh, subjects that they were interested in, woods, carpentry, metals, machine operating, auto, small machines, electronics, cooking, family consumer science. I had a, uh, at the uh, NAACP meeting a week ago, as a policeman came and looking to recruit and figure out how he could recruit local, uh, uh, local uh, students to be uh, at age 21 to be uh, police officers. And uh, he said, you know, he said, I stand and some of my other uh, police uh, officers and uh, policemen and police women stand at these construction sites and we watch the construction workers go by and with various skills and uh, they're all, there's very few African-American, Puerto Ricans or Caribbean-American workers among them. and. Uh, the, the problem lies right here in Hartford. We're not educating our students to take these jobs. We've got to do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Mildred Patton. My name is Mildred Patton. I'm a paraprofessional for 32 years. And in one of the schools that never got tested was Batchelder School, where I worked for 30 years. And I was there when they were doing construction too. And I'm not the only person from that school or Batchelder School that has either died or have cancer. I have cancer right now. I have multiple myeloma. And, and I'm still working. Now, I really would love to know to see if Batchelder was one of the schools that hasn't been tested to be tested. Because I don't think it's fair, me giving 32 years of my life, and it's gonna be going away for no reason, okay? I gave my life for other people's kids, and I'll keep on going until I could keep on going until I re had to retire. I don't think it's fair. I think that all schools should be tested. I worked for a bachelor's school for 30 years, and now I'm a nailer for two. And thank God for the staff that I have over there. They're very kind, because they're there. There are days that I cannot go to work, because my body hurts, because I have to go to chemo. So I just want you guys to know that I'm one of the people that came out of one of those schools. Now, I really would like to know if it's yes or no. Stephen Wilson. Good evening, everyone. I'm here tonight to talk about Weaver High School. Um, I'm here on behalf of a couple parents who weren't unable to come here tonight. Um, they wanted to be here yesterday, but the rescheduling. Um, but it's been brought to my attention. Um, there are some concerns with um, the environment at Weaver High School, specifically 
the classrooms, um, class sizes to be more specific. Um, right now, Weaver's class sizes are overcrowded. Um, can anyone here tell me what an optimal size class is for a child's development? Anyone? Well, Weaver's class sizes average at 30 plus. That's unacceptable. My understanding is, is that's not contractual towards teachers. Um, that's a safety issue. And I'd like to know what the board is going to do to address this. That's a lot of kids. Um, being a part of the Weaver Steering Committee, one of the major things that we talked about was the environment and setting these kids up for, um, to be able to succeed. And class sizes were one of them. And at 30 to one, that tells me that the class sizes or the staff that is there is, was set up that way. Weaver has 500 seats, 500. That sounds like it, there was an expectation of 30, 300 to 350 kids. Weaver is now at 487. While Kinsella in the same building has a ratio of 10 to 15 to one teacher. And those Weaver students cannot go over onto the Kinsella side on those core classes and take some of those classes to even out some of these class sizes. And I think that's unacceptable. We're not doing, doing right by our kids. Um, that was one issue that I wanted to talk about. The other issue is, I've, is also been brought to my attention by numerous parents who have gone down to the Welcome Center to get into Weaver. And this may be a little con contradictory, but they, from the start of the year, we're told um, we're being steered in a different direction, Harford High, Buckley. In a lot of cases, these kids are high-performing kids. And they're being steered. And these are the calls that I'm getting. And up until yesterday, there's a child right now who is moving in from Massachusetts. He is a straight-A student. He goes down to the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center tells him and his mother who have been there for, since 10 o'clock in the morning, they were there all day, that he had to go to Hartford High because of zoning. Now help me, because my understanding is there is no zoning unless we're talking about busing. And this kid has his own transportation. And they told him that he could not go to Weaver High School, that he would have to go to Hartford High. That parent called me, to which I explained to the parent that zoning, on, zoning only matters if he needs busing. She said he didn't. To which they then told him that, the, that Weaver's enrollment was closed. Weaver's enrollment is not closed. I know three parents this week whose child have been transferred over to Weaver. So that was a lie. So again, you know, we're talking about Weaver, we're talking about um, making sure that these kids are in the best situation possible. They're in overcrowded classrooms, and it seems like Weaver is becoming a dumping ground for kids who are not up to speed, so to speak. And, and kids need to, need to be in school, and they need to learn, but they need to be in the proper environment. And if high, all of the high-performing kids in this city and the North End are being sent elsewhere, and the kids with behavioral problems and who are not interested in learning are flooding these schools, what teacher is going to want to teach there? What kids or parents are going to want to send? What parents are going to want to send their kids there? So I'd like I'd like someone to get back to me regarding those class sizes. I'd like someone to get back to me regarding um, enrollment at Weaver. Um, we need to talk about staff. Right, they need resources because, it, it, you know, honestly, Kinsella's um, class sizes are Kinsella's class sizes, but clearly we need more teachers at Weaver to benefit these kids. We we all we hear about is a lot of fights, um, a lot of behavioral problems at Weaver. Well, you try sitting in the classroom with 32 kids. That's not even a quarter of the size of the classroom is not even a quarter of this room. You're jammed in there. How can teachers teach? 
How can they? And then they blame the kids. They don't know how to behave. Let's send them over to, um, what is it, Horizons or whatever that school is that's bad, or let's expel them or something to that effect, right? But you don't give them the tools or the environment that would allow them to succeed. I'm done. That completes public comment. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Uh, so now that we have a, a quorum, and I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Stallings, who is not well, but made it here so that we could have a quorum. I hereby call to order December 18th, 2019 regular meeting. I wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone present and to our television viewers. The board, superintendent, and I are pleased that you have joined us as we celebrate achievement, review information, and make policy decisions related to the effective operation of the Hartford Public Schools. This is a regular meeting, and all items that will be discussed or voted on this evening have been posted as required by state law. As the Hartford Board of Education, we are here to set goals, listen to reports of the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. We are not here to make management decisions or solve the problems of individuals. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. The monthly meetings of the board are open to the public. They are the time when the board conducts its business of governing the school system in a public arena. The regular meetings are not meetings with the public. Therefore, comments from the audience will be confined to the time designated for the public to address the board. Decorum and courtesy are important elements in effective public meetings. Please silence your cell phones or communication devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Since it is legally mandated that proceedings be accurately recorded, I may have to ask for order periodically should noise begin to interfere with our recording capabilities. I am pleased that you have taken the time this evening to join us. We are very proud of the school system and thank you for your interest in the Hartford Public Schools. Now I will read the statement in Spanish. Buenas noches. Llamando a orden esta reunión ordinaria de la Junta el 18 de diciembre de 2019. Damos una cálida bienvenida a todas las personas presentes y a nuestros televidentes. La Junta y la Superintendente se complacen que se han unido a nosotros para celebrar logros, revisar información y tomar decisiones relacionadas con el funcionamiento efectivo de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Esta es una reunión ordinaria. Todos los asuntos que serán discutidos o votados en esta tarde han sido notificados como lo requiere la ley estatal. Como Junta de Educación de Hartford, estamos aquí para establecer metas, escuchar los informes de la superintendente, aprobar los presupuestos, contratos y nombramientos de personal y establecer normas para el distrito. No estamos aquí para tomar decisiones administrativas o resolver problemas individuales. La administración es la responsabilidad de la superintendente. Las reuniones mensuales de la Junta están abiertas al público. Son el momento en que la Junta lleva a cabo su tarea de gobernar el sistema escolar en un espacio público. Las reuniones regulares no son reuniones con el público. Por lo tanto, los comentarios de la audiencia se limitarán al tiempo designado para el público dirigirse a la Junta. El decoro y la cortesía son elementos importantes en reuniones públicas eficaces. Por favor, silencie sus teléfonos celulares o dispositivos de comunicación y absténganse de hablar mientras otros están hablando. Ya que es mandato legal de que los procedimientos sean grabados con precisión, es posible que tengamos que pedir orden periódicamente si el ruido interfiere con nuestras capacidades de grabación. Nos complace que se haya tomado el tiempo esta tarde para unirse a nosotros. Estamos muy orgullosos de este sistema escolar y le damos gracias por su interés en las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Y tengo que pedir disculpas que esta noche no tenemos traductor, por el cambio de hora de la reunión. Sí, por eso tengo que pedirle sus disculpas y espero que entienda. So, report of the chair. I just have a few brief announcements. Uh, next month, we will begin our meetings at Weaver High School. Uh, our plan is to eventually have the meetings in the auditorium. We will most likely have this one 
in the black box theater because there's still some technical equipment that is being installed in the auditorium. Uh, so this is our last meeting at SMSA for this school year. Uh, we have with us this evening two new additions to our board. Uh, we have students representative who are here to uh, represent the student voice. I don't seem to have their information. Oh, I have it. Sorry. Excuse me. So the two young ladies are uh, high school students, and the students uh, that participate in the board on the board do not get a vote, but they are welcome to participate in all of our discussions. They usually have information reports about what's happening uh, in the student body. This being their first meeting, they are not prepared to present reports this month, but they will next month. So our representatives are Lloydia Anderson, who's a high school senior attending the University High School of Science and Engineering. She is currently in the process of applying to colleges and has gotten into four so far. She is planning to major in civil engineering with a minor in international relations. Lloydia is currently a member of her school's math team and senior student council. From this experience, she hopes to gain a better understanding of what factors are considered in the decisions that affect our schools and how laws and policies are made. Lloydia, we welcome you to the board. Thank you. And we also have Siskia Linton. She is a high school junior attending Global Communications Academy. After graduation, she plans to attend an Ivy League school, preferably Yale. She hopes that her time on the board will amplify student voice and bring good to our community. And I welcome you, Siskia. Thank you. And if any of you have any comments you'd like to make, you're welcome to. You don't have to. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, we have two of the people up here who were recently honored by the community. Uh, board member Kimberly Oliver was honored on Saturday by the Daniel Martin Foundation as an unsung hero. Uh, there were 15 people that were recognized and we are proud that Kim was one of them. The Unsung Hero Award was established to recognize and acknowledge a group of people who has made significant contributions above and beyond their position with their employer or organization. So Kim, we're very proud of you. And our superintendent, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez, was recognized recently by the uh, Hartford Current as one of 30 women of distinction who are remarkable leaders making a difference in our community. So Dr. Torres Rodriguez, we are very proud of you and thank you for the work you've been doing with us. A sort of a administrative uh, item is that uh, in our continuing effort to improve our uh, operations, we have now started uh, presenting monthly reports to the Finance Committee. So you will find those reports online with all the other committee reports. Um, those are reports from the Finance Department. And finally, uh, Mr. Craig Stallings has asked if he could make uh, a few remarks, so I will allow him to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for yielding some time to me. Um, I honestly expected to wait 
to after the, com the finance committee, so I appreciate that. Um, and I wish that most of the people that were talking here talking about the PCBs were still here. Um, because I was the board member featured in that story, um, and there was a reason why I agreed to do that story. And the first thing I want to say is, um, this PCB issue is a long-standing issue. It began with Clark. It began with a different board and a different superintendent. And I'm not making excuses for this board or superintendent. That's just a simple fact. The mediation of that school was over a million dollars. And as you know, we have had uh, a serious financial crisis within the Hartford Board of Education. Uh, we've had a $25 million deficit uh, a couple years ago. I think we have that now. Therefore, the board uh, by itself, because the board does not fund itself, we cannot afford testing by ourselves. Harford, the city of Harford has an 18-member legislative team. We rely on the city for leadership. The Honorable Pedro Seguera filed a lawsuit against Monsanto's. That lawsuit is still standing. Um, to my knowledge, the um, case was argued in April, and the city's attorney was participating in that litigation. And so the ball is actually in the city's court, not the board's. Uh, again, and I'm not trying to make excuses, that's simply just a hardcore fact. Now, the superintendent, upon her um, installation, she put together a district model of excellence. And the first thing we did was phase one of facil a facilities plan. And part of that was to address some of these issues that we're, we're all concerned with, with these, the buildings and the PCBs and asbestos and so forth and so on. We all feel that it is um, unacceptable to have our children in these kind of facilities. Hence why you've seen the Thurman L. Milner School close and move to Tower Avenue. We're trying to make those adjustments through the District Model of Excellence. And I simply just want to say in closing, if there was any failure to deliver that information, um, if there was any confusion in that, that news, that media clip, that report, um, it is not the superintendent's fault. I, that's all my, That's all me. And so if anyone should be blamed and yelled at, it would be me, not the superintendent. Hence why I did the story. Because I, I think, am the only board member that was still on the board that was there during that Clark Street incident. And my advocacy was behind the scenes but this is an issue that affects our community as a whole. This is not just isolated to a building. This is not just isolated to a school building. This is not just, just isolated to teachers. Our community is being affected by this. This is an environmental threat. This is all hands on deck. This is not simply just let's isolate our attacks. Let's, let's vent our frustrations. By all means, please do that. And we're here to, to take that. But the purpose of that interview was to expose a wider issue. If there are PCBs emanating in the, the air and if it's in the soil, that affects not just past generations but future generations, not just our, 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 our people living directly across the street, which I live across the street from Clark Street School. I have an elderly mother. So, we had a few, um, and I'm almost done. We also had advocacy when one chain existed with a dump that was also housed in North Hartford. North Hartford has serious environmental issues. Hartford has seri serious environmental issues. And the only way we're going to get through this is together. And so I say right now, again, that Corporation Council right now, the ball is in that court. That's where it is. If any one of you would like to go to the State uh, Department of Education and lobby for some money, let's do that. The Harford delegation has not been engaged in this conversation, so we can't cast any blame on them. And we have one here, and he can honestly tell you, no, no one's come to him and said anything about this issue. And so 
we need to do a better job on a city level communicating with one another and working with one another. That's where we should focus our attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your time. I appreciate it. Um, and again, I'll simply say that uh, the DME is a solid plan. The superintendent and the board deserve all the praise for that, that work and that plan and all the criticism comes to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stallings. How we move on to the superintendent's report? Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Chairman Flores referenced that our reports are online, and so my report um, will be there as well. And usually, because we have our celebrations at the beginning, um, I limit what it is that I lift for my report, but everything, all the content is there for you to access online. And I just want to do a couple highlights. One is with um, an event that we did have last month for our um, families. Uh, the Office of Family and Community Partnership did host a family convening on November 12th at Rawson School as part of the School Family Partnership Series. And the topic for that evening was, how is my child doing and how can I help? And this was a collaboration with the Office of Academics. And the event really focused on learning, learning for our families and for our staff, specifically, uh, specifically around grade level lessons in literacy and in math from pre-K-12, and then uh, resources and strategies that were provided to extend and reinforce the learning uh, at home. We often hear our families asking for strategies uh, to extend the learning, and we wanted to make sure that we provided those for our families. Highlighting uh, that uh, the Hartford Public Schools community radio, we have launched the live stream of WQTQ 89.9 .9 FM, um, which is a community radio broadcast service, and the live stream does reach beyond the boundaries of the typical radio signal range, providing opportunities to share not only district information, events, successes with the audience, but also um, happenings and um, other events related to our community. The station will be a core component of student experience along with the TV production studio at the Weaver campus. And um, the live stream can be accessed via the new uh, website, www.wqtq.fm. So uh, whether it is on your mobile phone, you know, just ask, ask Alexa to tune into WQTQ. And uh, lastly, uh, just a highlight to our transportation department. We did launch the Safe School, uh, the Safe Stop Parent app, um, to uh, for students who ride the uh, HPS buses. And now students and families are able to see when the school buses are arriving to student stops and when they are arriving to the school. We currently just have 130 families that have logged, uh, that have signed up for the app, and so wanted just to make sure that we reference this opportunity that's available. Uh, information and the instructions about it um, was shared via email and was also on our district website. Again, just trying to be more efficient and effective with opportunities to communicate with, with our families. And that concludes uh, my updates. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, the committee reports are available online. We have next on the agenda two contract approvals, but we actually need a quorum to vote on them, and Mr. Stallings had to step out. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he is not well, and he should be back momentarily, but if it's okay with my colleagues, perhaps we can move on to the first reading of, of policies. Uh, item 4.4, first reading students 50488 88 policy. Uh, Ms. Oliver, as a member of the policy committee, is there anything you'd like to say on this? Uh, just brief comments, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the, uh, Policies, for the most part, while well, the changes you're seeing are state-mandated changes, um, and so primarily, uh, please be aware of that. Uh, what I'll do is just quickly uh, highlight uh, one or two things from each of all four. So in terms of the students' um, 504 ADA policy, again, we had to update the complaint procedures based on uh, new uh, state uh, requirements. 
For the uh, smoking policy, we had to update it to reflect smoking's not allowed anywhere on our school grounds or property owned, leased, contracted for, or utilized by the board. For the SGC, we uh, had to make updates uh, to increase the term limit from two to four terms for elected members. And then finally, regarding sexual harassment, uh, the updates were to extend the days that a formal written complaint can be filed from 100 to 300 days. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. And this is a first reading, so we simply uh, receive it and there are no uh, votes required. Uh, so let's go back to 4.2, contract approval, the village for families and children. We're having some difficulties with our, oh, I'm sorry, 4.1. We're having some difficulties with the uh, internet. So I, The recommended action is a motion that the Hartford Board of Education authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with the village for families and children for the term delineated in the contract at an amount not to exceed $100,000 ending July 31st, 20, and uh, I'm sorry, that is the wrong one. Yes, yes, okay, I'm sorry. An amount not to exceed $125,000 ending July 31st, 2020. Madam Superintendent. Uh, thank you. As we know that one of our priorities is to strengthen our family and community partnerships by guaranteeing that there are mutually beneficial learning focused partnerships. And one way that we do that is through actualizing on our community schools framework. And um, community schools coordinating agency, in this case Catholic Charities, will deliver critical services to Madonna Middle School students and their families, and thereby increase student achievement and attain other positive outcomes for our students. Um, this agency specifically will provide more than one type of service to our students and the community, inclusive of uh, academic support and services, tutorial, community-based learning, and other enrichment activities, medical service provision, primary uh, vision, dental, and nutritional services, mental health uh, service provision, including counseling and access to uh, clinical staff, and adult education classes. Uh, this is, as you also know, uh, part of the expansion of our implementation of the community school framework. Are there any questions from the board members? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve this contract? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Item 4.2, contract approval, the village for families and children. Recommended actions, motion that the Hartford Board of Education authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with the village for families and children for the term delineated in the contract and amount not to exceed $100,000 ending July 31st, 2020. Madam Superintendent. Thank you. Um, 
fairly similarly. Um, this is also in alignment with our efforts to strengthen our partnerships with our families and our community. Um, community Schools Coordinating Agency, in this case, the Village for uh, Families and Children, will deliver the critical services and supports to SAND elementary school students and their families um, around the uh, variety of service provision, including tutorial, academic supports, uh, medical services, mental health services, and adult education classes. Um, the Village is a longstanding partner for Hartford Public Schools and um, they are, in this case, the coordinating agency. Any questions from the board members? Hearing none, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor of approving this contract signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Item 4.3, contract continuation approval, expeditionary learning. The recommended action is a motion that the Hartford Board of Education authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with expeditionary learning for the term delineated in the contract at an amount not to exceed $68,300 ending June 30th, 2020. Madam Superintendent. Thank you. Um, Expeditionary Learning Education's core practices um, follow a very specific design uh, principles. The uh, package here uh, includes services to faculty and the school leadership to foster the full implementation of their design. Um, as you might remember, uh, we discussed before a reduction in uh, this contract and in the amount of, uh, the amount of schools that we're ultimately partnering. Um, the district has partnered with EL for uh, some time now, and um, we are now reducing this contract for two schools, uh, ELAMS and uh, Sanchez. There have been over the years a number of practices at the teacher, teacher leadership, and school leadership level that um, have become part of the fabric, and so we are um, reducing and phasing the work um, out of the contract into the work that we're doing at the district level and at the district in each, and, and the work that the schools are doing. And so um, if you think about the comparison to last year, we are reducing the contract. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The motion carries. And we have the first reading of uh, the School Governance Council policy. Ms. Oliver? Uh, we have reviewed all of the first readings. I gave it all at the same time. Sorry, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> so we had the first reading of the smoking policy. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Oliver already made her comments on that. And lastly, it was the first reading of the sexual harassment policy, 4.7, so they have all been received by the board. Uh, and we have the consent agenda, and there's actually only one item on the consent agenda. So is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The consent agenda is approved. And we move on to an executive session. And this is in relation to pending claims and uh, litigation. And we will want to have with us the superintendent, our interim CFO, uh, Ms. Katie Roy, our attorney, James Pomerantz, and the executive director of human resources, Natasha Banks. Uh, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor of going to executive session? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? 
the ayes have it, we are in executive session.